so uh, i am here to talk to you today about uh, the story of mumbai cricket maidans and maestros uh, i could not have uh, found a better photograph to encompass or to encapsulate what cricket means to the city of mumbai uh, you have uh, a landmark of old mumbai with a landmark of the new vibrant thriving metropolis of mumbai in the background the rajabai tower and the bombay stock exchange and of course this is where we all begin all uh, those who have served mumbai cricket and indian cricket with distinction over the years and decades they all begin like this with makeshift stumps and uh, uh, tennis or a rubber ball uh, finding whatever little plot of land they can come across to to play their favorite sport cricket mumbai as we all know is india's commercial and cosmopolitan capital but it also happens to be a cricket uh, our cricket capital uh this photograph is a sort of who's who of mumbai cricket many of these uh, people uh, will be uh, talked about uh, some of them today some of them uh, in another session but mumbai is, this is the who's who of mumbai cricket this was a function organized a couple of decades ago where they got a, a lot of cricketers who had played for mumbai many of whom also played for india um, and you know this this was a, this was a great occasion to be at so it's it's india's commercial and cosmopolitan capital as well as the cricketing capital and we will we will find out why it is the cricketing capital i will throw some stats at you uh, 79720 runs 1447 wickets 1041 catches and 43 stumpings these modest figures are the contribution of mumbai to indian cricket so if you add up the number of runs contributed by mumbai players for the indian team in test cricket over the decades it comes to 79720 this will include the sunil gavaskar's 10122 uh, sachin tendulkar's 15986 uh, vengsarkar's 6868 and so on 1447 wickets will include zahir khan's 300 plus uh, the uh, raju kulkarni uh, nilesh kulkarni uh, eknath solkar ramakant desai it will include all these people their wickets that they took for mumbai ravi shastri 151 100 uh, 1041 catches all the great catches that were held close in and in the outfield by mumbai cricketers and 43 stumpings contributed by mumbai's uh, by wicket keepers from mumbai who went on to play for india and i'm not even talking about one day internationals here or 2020 internationals this is just test cricketing stats so if you add one day cricket to the mix and t20 cricket to the mix then um, the figures will really go through the window because we all know about rohit sharma having scored three double centuries in one day cricket uh, you know so the, the figures will go for a six if i if you add one day cricket but this is mumbai's contribution to indian cricket and this is a photograph that again encapsulates maidan cricket in mumbai at its best you have lots of matches going on simultaneously often uh, the the slip fielder in one match is rubbing shoulders with the mid off or mid on in another uh, fielder in another game uh, there have been cases of uh, cricketers being uh, run out batsmen being run out because they thought that uh, this fielder to whom they have hit the ball did not belong to their game but then they realized the hard way that he actually belonged to their match i was one such victim you know i remember playing a game where lots of people in whites all around matches going on simultaneously and i hit a ball to a fielder and i thought oh him this is this guy is playing some other game but actually unfortunately for me he belonged to my match and i was run out so this is the extent of mumbai's contribution to indian cricket the city has produced a staggering 71 test cricketers if you go all the way back to vijay merchant in the 1930s and come to shardul thakur Uh, in 2019 we have produced 71 test cricketers plus four who only played one day cricket so no other city no other state in anywhere in the world has can boast of such a record we have produced as many as 10 captains for india uh, the images uh, are of some stalwarts vinu mankad pauli umrigar gulab rai ramchand ajit wadekar who taught us how to win abroad Sunil Gavaskar, Dilip Bengsarkar, Ravi Shastri, the great Sachin, Bharat Ratna, and then of course in modern times you have Ajinkya Rahane who has led India in a couple of Test matches, and Rohit Sharma who is our de facto 
a vice captain leads the team whenever virat is is out of action so we have the, the city has produced 10 india captains so far let's digress a bit from mumbai uh, we let's go all the way back to 1721 this was when we had the earliest recorded reference to the game of cricket being played on indian soil so there was a british sailor called downing whose ship was anchored off the gulf of cambe the gulf of khambat in modern day gujarat and he noted in his diary that every day we distracted ourselves playing cricket and other exercises so 7 1721 marks the earliest recorded reference to cricket being played on indian soil 1787 was when the marylebone cricket club the mcc which is uh, the, the the keeper of the laws of cricket was set up in in england and merely 5 years later we had the cricket kolkata cricket and football club being set up in kolkata it still stands it is called the cc and fc the cc and fc is the second oldest cricket club in the world and that that was set up in kolkata in 1792 but of course uh, this club catered only to the europeans the british who were stationed in in kolkata they played the sport indians had still not taken to cricket it was uh, probably inevitable that the gateway to the british empire the melting pot uh, the the premier port of the british empire mumbai would uh, see the the thriving of cricket and see the locals first taking up cricket because uh, the british were would uh, use mumbai as their bastion and it was uh, probably a formality that mumbai took the lead in showing the rest of the country how cricket was played because there was a lot of scope for the natives in mumbai to learn cricket by watching the colonial masters in action so i just got a few photographs this the one on top is that of the mumba devi temple to whom the city owes its name then uh, the docks and of course uh, the bmc building and the victoria terminus building now known as this uh, raj uh, cst there is a there is a word in mumbai slang which uh, has no direct translation in english it, it is khadus it means resilient it means stubborn it means courageous and it means determined so khadus is a combination of resilience stubbornness courage and determination and this is the quality with which all mumbaikars are endowed uh, and uh, this khadus attitude uh, sort of it was it was again inevitable that it would reflect on the cricketing field as well because it was anyway reflecting in in other walks of life uh, we are no strangers to natural disasters and calamities but the spirit of mumbai i know it's a much abused term in the recent times but the spirit of mumbai does come through uh, it is coming through even now when we are going through a rather dreadful phase and uh, but there is reason to be optimistic and uh, the, the fact is that uh, we should hope that the city uh, like the rest of the country will overcome the current uh, times that we are passing through this is where it all began in mumbai the triangular patch of land which was then known as the esplanade maidan today it is known as the azad maidan this is where it all began for mumbai cricket as well as indian cricket uh the locals the natives the colonized imitated the colonizers and in 1848 the orient cricket club was set up by the parsis the parsis were the first indian community to take to cricket and in 1848 they set up the orient cricket club after observing uh, the the british in action on the esplanade they made uh, do with some ramshackle makeshift equipment uh, old bats balls they got everything together and they started a cricket club the parsis were an affluent community and they undertook two tours of england one in 1886 and 1888 where uh, they did very well 1886 they did not do all that well they lost more matches than they won but in two years time when they went to england again uh they did very well they won a few games and their top cricketer of the time was a doctor by profession his name was dr mehla shah pauri who was a fast bowler and he did rather well on those two tours of england in 1890 the unthinkable the unimaginable happened there was a team that had come to india to the indian subcontinent from england and the objective of this team was to play against the british who were stationed in india across the subcontinent they sort of uh, condescended to play a two day match against the parsis you know chalo let's let's humor them a bit and they uh, agreed to play a two day match against the parsis at the esplanade maidan and they lost that game the parsis won that game by four wickets 
and that led to some unbelievable scenes of celebration. This is a, a very interesting character. He, his name is Lord Harris. He was the governor of Bombay province in the 1890s. What happened was that uh, by this time, the Parsis, the Hindus and the Muslims, the three premier Indian communities, they had all started playing cricket. Uh, some of you may be a little surprised as to why I'm referring to communities as such, but the times were like that. In the late 19th century, uh, a community would stick to its own people. Uh, we all know what happened in 1857. The, the struggle, the first war of independence had ended in disaster and uh, the Indians were still picking up the pieces of the, of the struggle for independence. So the 1890s were a time when communities stuck to their own people. So you had the Parsis, the Hindus and the Muslims all playing cricket at the Esplanade Maidan. But they had one complaint. Their complaint was that when the British would play polo on the Esplanade grounds, uh, they would end up damaging the cricket pitches of the Parsis, Hindus and Muslims. So there was a bit of a controversy. And Lord Harris, who in his time was a cricketer of repute, he came to the rescue. He obviously wanted the cricketing activity to flourish. But at the same time, he could not be seen to be favoring the natives at the cost of his own people. So he allotted space on the Mumbai seafront to the three communities to set up their own gymkhanas where they could play all the cricket that they wanted. Accordingly, we had uh, the Hindu gymkhana, the Islam gymkhana and the Parsi gymkhana being set up on what is modern day Marine Drive. That's the legacy of Lord Harris. And as we all know, these three nurseries of Mumbai cricket and Indian cricket still stand. They are still there. The PJ Hindu Gymkhana, next to it is the Islam Gymkhana, and next to it is the Parsi Gymkhana. So that is the legacy of Lord Harris. Uh, 1892 is another significant year because the British decided that the Parsis had improved so much at cricket. You must remember, they are the rulers. So you know, they, they were the rulers, so they had all the decision-making powers. So they figured that the Parsis had improved so much that you know, we could think in terms of playing an annual match against them every, you know, every year, an annual game. And that is how uh, the annual presidency match began in the year 1892 between the British and the Parsis. But it did not remain a two-team affair for long because the Hindus joined this presidency match in the year 1907, thus making, the two, thus making it a tri-series. Uh, in 1912, the Muslims joined, thus making it a quadrangular. And then in 1937, the rest, all the communities that were left, the Christians, Anglo-Indians, Jews, they put together a team and they joined uh, in 1937. So this tournament became a pentangular five-team tournament. The teams were picked by the respective gymkhanas in Mumbai. And although this tournament was played on communal lines, it brought the public together like, like never before. There was an instance of Hindu-Muslim riots in the 1930s. And those riots stopped when this tournament began because the people who were fighting on the streets, they merely went to the stadium. To, to, uh, they went to the ground to watch the matches. So although this was a tournament played on communal lines, it did unite the public. This is one image of the joint uh, Parsi and Hindu players who played in the quadrangular. So this is when the Muslims had joined, but the rest hadn't joined. At that stage, it, it was a quadrangular, a four-team competition. This image needs no introduction. Uh, this film, of course, came very close to winning an Oscar. It was, of course, a fictional account set in the year 1893, a match between the Champaner 11 and the British. But uh, Ashutosh Gowarikar, the director and uh, writer of this film, had done his research. He had, his research was absolutely spot on. We come to this interesting character called Balu Palwankar. I would like to go back to this slide. You will remember that uh, there was a character, he's standing on extreme right, uh, Kachra. When uh, Bhuvan, played by Amir Khan, tries to get him into the team, everybody objects because they say that he is a chute. How can we get him into our team? But then, of course, Senar Council prevails and Kachra goes on to become the best bowler of the Champaner 11. He, in fact, takes a hat trick and he, in fact, turns the match upside down. So, Kachra had, Kachra's character was inspired by Balu Palwankar. Balu Palwankar uh, is a very interesting figure in Indian cricket history. He is probably the first great Indian spinner. When we talk about Indian cricket, we talk about the great Indian tradition of spin bowling. Balu Palwankar was the torchbearer of that tradition of spin bowling. 
he learned his early cricket when he was working as a groundsman at Pune club and the british station there used to uh, you know they they took a liking for him and they taught him the art of left arm spin very soon uh, tales of his uh, cricketing ability spread but the hindus were reluctant to field him in their team because they said that we cannot have an untouchable in our team leave alone playing he will not even uh, be allowed to enter the dressing room so how the question of his playing doesn't arise but then merit prevailed and balu palwankar eventually became the star player of the hindus and uh, his younger brother yashwant in fact went on uh, shivram beg your pardon his younger brother shivram went on to become the captain of the hindus in the quadrangular pentangular in later years balu palwankar also went on a tour of england that was uh, arranged by the maharaja of patiala one of the earliest uh, backers of indian cricket in the year 1911 so the maharaja of patiala put together a team of cricketers from um, uh, different parts of the country by that time of course the game had spread to every nook and corner of the country and balu palwankar went on that tour and he took uh, 75 wickets from 14 matches which which comes to more than 5 uh, wickets per game he took for 75 wickets from 14 matches and at an average so more than 5 wickets per game came back got a rousing reception in mumbai and he was uh, at the, the he was felicitated publicly in mumbai and uh, one of the speakers at the felicitation was none other than a college student who answered to the name of bhimrao ambedkar so for dr b r ambedkar balu palwankar was a role model and a boyhood hero this was balu palwankar for you and uh, you know completely inspired by the character of kachra and here we come to what is uh, unfortunately a, an outcome a, a fallout of our traditional aversion to history there is a road uh, which runs from uh, the prabha devi temple to the arabian sea uh, uh, is there anybody uh, uh, for all you know it may there may be somebody from uh, uh, who lives in that area a part of this presentation and that road is called p bau marg unfortunately most people who live on that road don't know who p bau was and that is an outcome of our traditional aversion to history that that road is named after balu palwankar uh, there aren't uh, too many landmarks named after cricketers in the city of mumbai which is ironic in itself but this is one rare landmark one road that is named after balu palwankar but even those who live on that road don't know uh, who he was uh, probably they should have had a biopic made on him by now but uh, i guess we'll have to wait before some history conscious filmmaker like ashutosh gowarikar comes forward and does the needful ashish dandi the sociologist uh, nailed it pretty much nailed it when he uh, defined cricket as being an indian game that was accidentally discovered by the english that that i think is probably one of the most perfect definitions of of indian cricket that you can ever hope to come across why did cricket become so popular in india there are lots of theories some ranging from the ridiculous to some that make some a little bit of sense first is that indians are crazy about numbers and statistics and we all know of people who uh, whose passwords are say you will you will have a sunil gavaskar fan who whose password might be 10122 after the number of runs that gavaskar scored in test cricket or a vvs lakshman fan may have 281 you know somewhere so we are crazy about numbers and statistics and cricket as we all know gives tremendous scope for us to indulge in numbers and stats second explanation indians are very good with their hands the monuments across the country the temples in south india the taj mahal and the red fort in north india they stand testimony to the fact that we are good in our good with our hands not so good with our feet uh, so that is that is one uh, reason that could be one reason why we were, we were so popular good at cricket because cricket is of course played with the hands the third reason is of course the most interesting indians like to do things together and at the same time wish that their individual contribution uh, we notice and appreciate it so this is like a cricket is of course a godsend where uh, you you are part of a team but at the same time your individual contribution is noticed and appreciated and most importantly in the late years of the 19th century the indians uh, for the indians the cricket field provided the opportunity for them to do to the british what they had failed to do on the battlefield in, in 1857 because in the late years of the 19th century the indian national congress was still in its nascent stage the indian struggle for independence pretty much did not exist so uh, success on the cricket field probably gave the indians vicarious pleasure 
and that is what that is why cricket became so popular in india 1875 saw the establishment of the bombay gymkhana where uh, for years famously dogs and indians were not allowed uh, the bombay gymkhana located at one end of the triangular uh, azad maidan in 1926 27 something interesting happened there was a team that came from england once again uh, to play against the british stationed in india there was they played a two day match against the hindus at the bombay gymkhana and in that match colonel c k naidu who could be termed as india's virat kohli of the 1920s scored 153 in 116 minutes that is less than 2 hours inclusive of 14 fours and six sixes it was an innings that made everybody sit up and uh, acknowledge the fact that indian cricket had arrived the british also realized that indian cricket had talent and they had reached a certain standard where they it could be considered giving them test match status but for india to get test status it was necessary for them to have an association which could run the game across the country so that is how uh, the bcci was formed in 1928 at the roshnara club in delhi it was subsequently headquartered in mumbai and india played its inaugural test match in 1932 at lords a three it was a three day test match which we played at lords in 1932 and in december 1933 england came to india for a three test tour and the first test match on indian soil was played at the same bombay gymkhana where at one point of time dogs and indians were not allowed entry uh, the rival captains were c k naidu for india and douglas jardine of, of for england Uh, Lala Amarnath, uh, who you see on the right, he scored a century in that match, but India lost that game by nine wickets. Obviously, we were ex- inexperienced compared to the British. Douglas Jardine, the the previous year had uh, virtually created a vertical split in the cricketing world with his use of the infamous body line tactics uh, in an Ashes series in Australia. But this particular series in India uh, showed up a completely different side of the man. He was, of course, born in Mumbai. so he he indi he had a soft corner for for india and uh, the the story goes that when lala amarnath uh, completed his century ck naidu who was at the other end he went down the length of the pitch to shake lala amarnath's hand and the wicket keeper of the england team had the ball with him and he could have run ck naidu out and he looked at douglas jardine you know just to ask whether he can run ck naidu out and douglas jardine said don't you know said no don't run him out so that was excellent sporting spirit uh, displayed by the architect of body line an individual who made his debut in that bombay gymkhana test match was vijay thakur si uh, when he was being admitted to his school his principal found the, the surname thakur si a little difficult to pronounce so he asked the boy what does your father do and uh, the boy said my father is a merchant so the principal promptly put his surname as merchant and that surname stuck to vijay for life and even his family started using that surname so vijay merchant was india's first uh, you could say he was mumbai's first indigenous cricketing great of all the people who came after him in later years vijay merchant was uh, was mumbai's first cricketing great he undertook two very successful tours of england in 1936 and 1946 where he made a great opening partnership with Sayyid Mushtaq Ali from Indore. Uh, they complemented each other very well because Vijay Merchant was technically very sound, played with a straight bat. So he was what uh, Rahul Dravid was. He was the Rahul Dravid, Sunil Gavaskar of his time, while Sayyid Mushtaq Ali was the Virender Sehwag of his time, coming down the wicket to hit the fast bowlers, playing cross batted shots. So they complemented each other very well on two tours of England in 1936 and 1946, separated by World War II. 1934 was when the ranji trophy was born it was obviously named after k s ranjit singh ji the first great indian cricketer um, he played test cricket for england way back in the 1890s when obviously india did not have a team of its own so ranjit singh ji played test cricket for england and uh, the ranji trophy was named for him it was donated the trophy was donated by the maharaja of patiala another uh, backer of indian cricket in its early years Mumbai is synonymous with Ranji Trophy excellence from 1934-35 to 2019-20 the city of Mumbai has made the Ranji Trophy its own it has featured in the final 46 times and won the title 41 times the second most successful team in the history of the competition is Karnataka which has 
eight victories to its credit. So you have the number one team with 41 wins and the number two team with eight wins. That just shows the, the sheer dominance of Mumbai in the Ranji Trophy. And uh, Mumbai's Ranji Trophy saga merits uh, a separate presentation to itself. We'll talk about that later. Mumbai, of course, won the Ranji Trophy in its first year in 1934-35, in its uh, 20, 25th year, in its 50th year, in its 60th year, in its 75th year, and several years in between. From the Bombay Gymkhana, then we come to Mumbai's second cricketing shrine. Uh, the Cricket Club of India uh, uh, was proposed to be built, and uh, Anthony DiMello, who was the secretary of the BCCI, he approached Lord Brebon, the then governor of Bombay province, in the 30s for a plot of reclaimed land and uh, he uh, Lord Brebon obviously brought it to his notice that uh, uh, the BCCI would have to pay a very hefty sum of money because after all reclaimed land did not come cheap but Anthony D. Mello then uh, put forth a proposal to Lord Brebon he asked Lord Brebon so what do you want do you want money for your government or do you want immortality for yourself and Lord Brebon went for immortality. That is how uh, uh, the Cricket Club of India acquired land at a throwaway price of one pound per square yard. And the Cricket Club of India was sure. called the Brebon Stadium as its headquarters. So these are a couple of images that I dug out. Uh, Lord Brebon laying the foundation stone of the stadium on 22nd May 1936. And then the, the Brebon Stadium as it stood then. Uh, nothing around it as you can see. Today, of course, it's it's a concrete jungle, a bustling part of the metropolis. The Brebon Stadium then obviously took over from the Bombay Gym as the premier venue for the Ranji oh, Trophy yes. pentangular games. Uh, at the Bombay Gym, obviously, makeshift stands had to be erected every time there was a match. But Brebon Stadium, there was no such problem. So the Brebon Stadium took over as the main venue for all the Ranji Trophy matches and the pentangular matches that were being played in Mumbai. Ayaz Memon, the senior journalist, once famously said that the Brebon Stadium was built with a grand vision and for the cause of cricket. It hosted 18 test matches and several domestic matches from the year 1937 to 1974. So what happened in the 1970s? Why did an arena like the Brebon Stadium lose out? Uh, we will come to that. Uh, th these, these are this, this is a panoramic shot of the, the Brebon Stadium and uh, one of the gates at the, the Brebon Stadium has been named after AFS Taliyar Khan. He was affectionately known as Bobby Taliyar Khan, the pioneer of cricket commentators. It is said that he refused to share the mic with anybody and he would speak for four or five days of a match. They said that his vocal cords were made of steel. Probably they were, you know, because he refused to share the mic with anybody. One of the gates at the CCI has been named after him. The CCI at one point of time housed the headquarters of the BCCI and the Mumbai Cricket Association. Uh, the BCCI had, was, was put up in a, uh, in a very dingy room uh, at the far end, at the hotel ambassador end. And um, I remember John Wright, the former Indian coach, writing in his book, that uh, the BCCI office, I mean, the, the, the office of the richest cricket board in the world, was the greatest feat of camouflage since a wolf donned sheep's clothing. So be, it was one dull, dingy room. Uh, and uh, But that is where the BCCI operated from for years. And the Mumbai Cricket Association also operated from the CCI. And that led to certain people at the CCI thinking that they could do whatever they wished. And that proved to be their undoing. Uh, whenever there was a match at the, at the Brebon Stadium, there would invariably be a tussle for seats between the Cricket Club of India, which owned the Brebon Stadium and which was a private club, and the Mumbai Cricket Association, which was the official representative of cricket in the city. Invariably, the CCI would not agree to Mumbai Cricket Association's demands for tickets. And matters came to a head in the early 70s, when the CCI virtually defied Mumbai Cricket Association that, look, uh, this is all that we can give. If you don't, if, if these terms are not acceptable to you, then you build your own stadium. The CCI was confident that uh, the government is not going to allow another stadium to be built. But then they had reckoned without Sheshrao Vankhede, whose photograph this is. Sheshrao Vankhede was then the finance minister in the government of Maharashtra. And he said, okay, we will build our own stadium. So it came about that virtually a stone's throw away from CCI, 
uh, there was an open space of land called the Lloyd's Reclamation Ground, which was chosen as the site of the new stadium. And Mumbai's third international cricketing arena came up at that site. Uh, quite appropriately, uh, uh, at a space which was called Lloyd's Reclamation, Clive Lloyd excelled in the very first test match to be played at the Vankhede Stadium. He scored an unbeaten 242. Uh, and uh, Sunil Gavaskar uh, went on to score five of his 34 test centuries at the Vankhede Stadium. So you have this unique situation where there are as many as three test venues adjacent to each other. We have had uh, uh, cities like Johannesburg, for example, has had three test venues. Colombo, in fact, has had four. But not within one point, within a circumference of 1.2 kilometers. So you have the Azad Maidan where the Bombay Gym is situated, then you have the Brebaum Stadium and then the Vankhede Stadium. So three test venues literally adjacent to each other. That is that is Mumbai for you. The Bombay Gym which hosted one test match, the Brebaum Stadium 1948 onwards. And of course the Vankhede Stadium which uh, has hosted 25 tests, oh, yeah. 22 one day internationals and 7 T20 internationals so far. It underwent a complete makeover for the 2011 World Cup. Oh, yeah. In 2006, the CCI made a brief comeback because they hosted many matches played in the uh, ICC Champions Trophy. Uh, Australia won that trophy. The final was played at the CCI. But the match ended up making publicity for all the wrong reasons because uh, the Australians, we all remember, they infamously pushed Mr. Sharad Pawar off the stage after uh, he had presented them the trophy. So, obviously, they apologized later, but the damage had been done. Uh, and then, of course, when the Vankhede Stadium was being renovated for the 2011 World Cup, uh, the CCI hosted a test match against Sri Lanka. India won that game and, in fact, went on to become the number one team in the ICC test ratings for the very first time. So, it was, in a way, appropriate that India became the number one team in the ICC ratings for the very first time after winning a test played at the former home of cricket because the Brebon Stadium had been designed as India's home of cricket. It was quite appropriate. In 2006, the BCCI moved from that dingy room at uh, the CCI to its own um, headquarters in the Vankhede Stadium complex. I have had the fortune of working in this new building. It's called the Cricket Center. It's a four-story building. Uh, the BCCI is housed on the second floor. The IPL office is on the fourth floor. The Mumbai Cricket Association is on the third floor. And there is a conference room with space and a museum on the first floor. So finally, the BCCI has uh, a swanky state-of-the-art uh, headquarters, which befits uh -huh. its state as, as the richest and most prosperous and most influential cricket board in the world. Two unforgettable matches at the new Ankhede post-2011 were, of course, the World Cup final, which we won. We beat Sri Lanka. And Sachin's last test in November 2013, where he had that uh, famous 22-minute speech where there was not a single... A dry eye in the in the audience at the Vankhede as well as uh, television audiences the world over. So we come to the nurseries of Mumbai cricket now. This was of course the number one Esplanade Maidan, now Azad Maidan. You can see the old building of the Bombay gym in the background there. That's the nursery where boys and girls still travel to play cricket. Then of course the new avatar of the Esplanade Maidan is the Azad Maidan, then the Oval Maidan, the Cross Maidan. This is the grassroots of Mumbai cricket. The legacy of Lord Harris, of course, Hindu Jimkhana, Islam Jimkhana, Parsi Jimkhana. And then in the 1940s and 50s, after Second World War, you had a northward shift. Uh, but before we go to the northward shift, here is a question. So we just talked about the legacy of Lord Harris and uh, we talked briefly about how he um, allotted land uh, on the Mumbai seafront for the three Indian communities to have their own Jimkhanas. What connects Lord Harris to two Mumbai schoolboys of the 1980s? nearly a, a century after he was from province. And the answer is the fact that two Mumbai schoolboys in, in February 1988, to be precise, they added a record 664 in the semi-final of the inter-school Harris Shield uh, for Shardashram Vidya Mandir against St. Xavier's School. Uh, these two boys need no introduction. They answer to the names of Sachin Tendulkar and Vinod Kamli. This is their connection with Lord Harris. Uh, it was the semi-final of the Harris Shield, played at the Esplanade Azad Maidan, where they added uh, 664 and became celebrities overnight. And as they say, the rest is history. 
then the northward shift as i said happened in the 1940s and 50s during the time of world war 2 uh, uh, many people shifted from south mumbai to central mumbai so shivaji park gained in prominence as a nursery of mumbai and indian cricket and it was complemented on the other side of the railway tracks by the dadkar maidan that, that it was it is commonly known as the ruya podar ground bank opposite the two colleges it was uh, subsequently named the dadkar maidan in honor of one of our war heroes so these were the two uh, nurseries of cricket in central mumbai uh, while cricketers like ajit wadekar subhash gupte vijay manjrekar were products of sandeep patil were products of shivaji park the likes of sunil gavaskar dilip bengsarkar sanjay manjrekar they were products of the dadkar maidan at matunda on either side of the railway tracks at dadkar the northward shift continues uh, the, the mumbai cricket association has developed state of the art facilities at bkc and kandivli uh, and uh, no effort is being spared to ensure that boys and girls who live in the satellite towns and in north mumbai they do not always have to travel all the way to south mumbai by train but facilities are provided for them infrastructure is created for them in in north mumbai as well and the mumbai cricket association has done a great job in that regard this is of course the dy patel stadium at nehru a magnificent facility it hosted uh, the ipl finals in 2008 and 2010 and it is uh, uh, it also hosted uh, the fifa under 17 uh, world cup uh, in in 2017 so uh, this is another uh, magnificent cricketing facility in the satellite town of mumbai uh, of nehru Uh, this basically brings uh, us to the end of this presentation but uh, there's a lot more that can be said about mumbai cricket about uh, the heroes who have rendered yeoman service to mumbai and indian cricket over the years this is of course the holy trinity of all the heroes vijay merchant sunil gavaskar and sachin tendulkar but there are many others as well and uh, i think they merit they deserve a separate session to themselves uh their contribution to mumbai cricket and indian cricket as well as mumbai's supremacy in the ranji trophy it 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 merits uh, a separate presentation so that's pretty much it for now uh i look forward to any questions that you may have and i also look forward to the next session that i will be doing where i will talk at length about the maestros of mumbai cricket and their contribution to mumbai and indian cricket as well as uh, the inter uh, club and inter corporate cricket culture of mumbai i look forward to doing that in my next presentation thank you very much great uh, thank you thank you so much devendra fascinating talk and a lot of tidbits of new information for you know all of us uh, we'll get to the questions now the first one is from farooq he's asking that is it correct that dada bhai nauruji came to the rescue of cricket when the britishers were usurping what is now azad maidan for polo and made it available for the general public no i just talked about lord harris so lord harris was uh, the individual who uh, in a way uh, allotted land to the three premier indian communities on the mumbai sea front for them to uh, fulfill you know to play cricket and other sports on the on the sea front so it was lord harris who took the lead in in doing that and those jimkhanas the parsi jimkhana the hindu jimkhana and the islam jimkhana all right the next question is actually from me because i stay on p balu mark uh, devendra so okay okay i had just recently looked up on him and found out this connection to lagan oh okay uh, so uh, any idea why the road over there specifically is named after him he lived in that area oh, okay okay yeah yeah we don't know where exactly but yeah but it's it's as i said it's ironic that in a city like mumbai there are there is hardly any landmark named after a cricketer so you have p balu mark then you have the vijay manjrekar lane at dadar portuguese church okay. not very far away and then you have a sunil gavaskar maidan at belapur cbd nothing else in the city no no landmark no street has been named after cricketers which is so ironic considering mumbai's uh, contribution to the sport right okay the next one is from kaivan he's asking any record of the winners of the pentangular and its predecessors were all communities equal or did one dominate the parsis dominated initially and then the hindus and muslims gained in prominence but all those records still exist uh, uh, vasant rai ji the doyen of uh, indian cricket historians who in fact passed away recently he has also written a couple of books on the quadrangular pentangular so all those records are there 
the parsis initially were the you know they they they, they, led, they led the way but then the hindus and muslims took over from them and in fact the last pentangular final was played between the muslims and the hindus in 1945 46 and the muslims won a nail biter by just one wicket all right uh an additional point to kevan's uh, previous question is that uh, how did parsis pick up the game was it something similar to lagan yes by observing they simply observed uh, the masters in action and that's how they they picked the picked up the game and the hindus and the muslims did likewise they merely observed uh, the masters playing the game at the esplanade and uh, they just started started imitating and then the imitation led to uh, uh, bigger achievements all right uh, there is a comment in fact by anand he's saying that if i'm not wrong Balwankar Balu was part of the three-member team led by Ambedkar to sign the Pune Pact. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, he contested the elections against Dr. Ambedkar and lost uh, because uh, so they did not have a fallout as such, but they had different ideologies. But for for Dr. Ambedkar, Balu Balwankar was uh, was a hero. And I, I also don't understand why historians insist on referring to him as Palwankar Balu. It should be the other way around. His surname was Palwankar, name was Balu, so it should be Balu Palwankar. Right. All right. The next question is, uh, it's from Siddharth. Uh, yeah. During the times of the pentangulars, weren't there teams by princely states like Holkar, Baroda, etc.? Till when? Till when did these teams continue? yeah the uh, cricket was being played across the country by the in the early years of the 20th century so the, they had started uh, the different princes had their sides but the pentangular had only these five teams so you had parsis europeans hindus muslims and the rest the ranji trophy when it started it had a few princely states like baroda holkar uh, participating in it and then of course uh, after independence when the princely states were dissolved Holkar became what is Madhya Pradesh today, and Baroda, although it it uh, became part of the state of Gujarat, it retained its its uh, cricket team. So today you have a situation where the the state of Gujarat has as many as three Ranji Trophy teams: Gujarat itself, Saurashtra, which was the former princely state of Navanagar, uh, where K S Ranjit Singh ji came from, and Baroda. So all these teams started pop, uh, playing the Ranji Trophy after 1934. and previously they uh, uh, the princes who were in love with cricket they used to organize festival cricketing festivals cricket tournaments across the country but competitive cricket really began with the ranji trophy uh, with with state team in, in fact holkar was a very successful team in the early years of the ranji trophy won won the ranji trophy four or five times in the decade between 1934 and uh, uh, 1948 49 if memory serves me right holkar was a very successful team right Uh, for the next question, uh, Devendra, if you just if you could just go to the previous slide where you had shown the Ranji Trophy. Yeah. Okay. So Ankur actually just uh, pointed out that uh, the map of India on the trophy there is is the is the United India. So it's just. You know what? The BCCI is criticized for a lot of things. Uh, like I have worked there. It it is everybody's favorite punching bag. But there are. many things that the bcci has done right and one of them is that the trophy that was donated by the maharaj of patiala in 1934 35 it is still being used uh, as the ranji trophy which explains that base with the map of undivided india i remember there was a, a mini controversy uh, in in the year 2003 or 4 when some people objected to that but i mean we have to honor tradition the ashes urn which uh, was used first in 1882 that is still being used by england and australia so why can't we use the old ranji trophy yeah true true uh, the next question is from abhishek he is asking is it true that ramakant athrekar forced tendulkar to declare and not continue in the game yes 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 uh, the, actually what happened is uh, he wanted both of them to uh, play in another game that had that was being that that was to start the next day but unknown to him uh, these guys batted on and on and on so uh, i think uh, his assistant told the boys that sir is very angry with you please call him immediately so at the lunch break so they called him from a public phone and he just blasted them left right and center as to why they hadn't declared because he needed them for another game 
and vinod kamli asked him sir uh, i am batting on 349 so can i just score one more run and then declare he said just give give the four to sachin and he told sachin nothing doing just declare immediately so they ended up declaring and at lunch interval and uh, spared the saint xavier's boys because the saint xavier's team was in total disarray one of the bowlers actually broke down and refused to bowl you know they were in total disarray imagine 664 runs lots of balls being lost because they were be hitting them <laughs> a far distance so yeah atrekar sir did for sachin to declare all right uh, the next question is from anand he's asking could you also recall some wonderful cricketers in mumbai maidans uh, but who could not rise to either the mumbai ranji team or represent india uh, is additional question is how is mumbai today for women cricketers since much of literature now records find women cricketers in the city other than a diana edinji well anand uh, this is precisely what i'm going to cover in the next presentation just be patient because uh, it really cannot be fitted into one but you mentioned about the maestros uh, the famous the, the, the well known ones as well as the lesser known ones and you mentioned women's cricket so all that will be covered at length in the next presentation just be patient okay great uh The next one is from Commander Narayan. Uh, he's asking, is it possible to access recordings of Bobby Talyar Khan and Anand Setelwar's cricket commentary? All India Radio would have uh, them in their archives. Uh, I think All India Radio uh, would be having them. Unlike Doordarshan, which uh, is known for erasing stuff, uh, I can tell you from personal experience that Doordarshan uh, just erases a lot of the priceless uh, stuff of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. but uh, all india radio i'm sure will will have a few recordings sure uh the next one is from farooq if you were to name one maidan as the birthing place of indian cricket would it be the oval or the azad 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 because esplanade because that is where it all began and uh, uh, you know then that azad maidan may in a way showed the way for other uh, maidans obviously the shivaji park and the the ruya podar ground gained in prominence in the later years but obviously the pioneering maidan was the azad maidan which was then called the esplanade maidan because that is where it all began all right a uh, question from kevan is is club cricket dead in the city you don't see the old established clubs being influential anymore whether it is the jimkhanas or clubs like dadar union and mb union i wouldn't say it is dead uh but again that is something i will be covering in my next presentation uh there there are clubs that are doing well but yes um, uh, you know the the presence of stalwarts uh, the, 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 the 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 stalwarts of the 50s 60s and 70s they made it a point to represent their clubs whenever they were available and that sort of rubbed off on the youngsters so that is something because of the sheer uh, you know the the, uh, the the sheer number of cricket matches international cricket matches being played probably the stars of today generation are unable to make that time out for their clubs and their uh, offices and that has led to a bit of an issue but uh, it would be wrong to say that club cricket is dead uh, it could do with uh, some of the stalwarts making time uh, to participate in club cricket because nothing can be more uh, inspiring than a youngster watching a legend of the sport in action or maybe batting with him or sharing a dressing room with him uh, which is what used to happen In in the fifties, sixties, till the eighties. All right. Uh, the next question, and this is uh, something which I was even about curious about, is you see a lot of sports shops in and around uh, Azad Maidan, especially in the Dhobi Talao area. Any particular reason why they came up there, or is it connected to cricket? Yes, because uh, because of the proximity to Azad Maidan, cross oval, you know, because of the proximity. All right, and. Uh, Bharat is asking, what is the contribution of Wagle Sports, which is the oldest sports shop in the country, in the initial days of cricket in Mumbai? Huge, huge. Uh, all the sports shops, not just Wagle, is, but I think all the sports shops. Uh, many of the sports shops were known to give uh, discounts to youngsters who probably could not afford the equipment. So there are many unsung heroes of of Mumbai cricket. Uh, it's not just the players who who constitute Mumbai cricket, but you have uh, on lookers on the maidans the umpires the groundsmen uh, and even the sports shop manufacturers and the sellers they are all part of that great uh, institution called mumbai cricket so i believe there is also one shop uh, in dhobitalao in a lane called trinity lane which makes bats and even to this day i think it's it's very popular for uh, making bats for players who play in the ipl especially yes 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 in all day, right 
they are the unsung heroes okay the next question uh, well actually uh, it's a comment by jatin he says now i know the logic behind the three grounds adjacent to marine lines thanks for this delightful behind the scenes story yeah the egos you know the <laughs> CCI is such a beautiful venue. Uh, it's but you know, a lovely clubhouse. It was designed uh, as India's answer to Lords, but then uh, it all went awry. And then the Vankhede Stadium had to be built. The Vankhede Stadium, of course, is in its current avatar is magnificent. Uh, you know, the, but it looks like a looks like a flying saucer when the lights are on. Yeah, but yes, uh, it, it it could have been avoided had some people put their egos aside. All right. Uh, question from Mithen is: How many cricket coaching nets or clinics used to run on Shivaji Park simultaneously? Lots. Very difficult to put a finger on it. There are so many plot, different plots of land. You know, I, mean, I used to uh, go. Uh, my coach was Anna Vaidya, who also coached uh, Sandeep Patil. Uh, so I, I used to go to Anna Vaidya, and uh, a few feet away used to be Acharya Sir's nets. so very difficult to put a finger on it even the open spaces in between the plots the pitch plots would be occupied by youngsters doing fielding practice catching practice so very very difficult to put a finger on it what i know for sure is that uh, the azad maidan at one point of time had 22 pitches uh, many of those pitches have been taken over by the metro today but 22 pitches so there used to be 22 cricket matches being played simultaneously at the azad maidan and the same goes for shivaji park and the ruya podar ground okay uh, moving on uh, this is actually a number of questions from kevan uh, but he's asking how do you explain the present decline of mumbai cricket i don't think mumbai cricket has declined uh, other uh, areas other parts of the country have caught up with mumbai uh, we last won the ranji trophy in 2015 16 which is not very long ago so it would be wrong to say that mumbai cricket is in decline it is just that uh, the bcci has done phenomenal work in uh, uh, making the sport popular across the length and breadth of the country and the indian cricket team today is a truly representative team uh, till uh, the end of the 20th century the indian cricket team primarily would comprise four players from mumbai three from bangalore uh, maybe two from delhi one from chennai it was a primarily an urban sport but we saw we know what happened in the new millennium you had places like ranchi and jalandhar uh, producing cricketers Uh, today you, we are in a situation where teams like gujarat vidarbha and saurashtra which not very long ago were considered lightweights absolute weaklings they have been winning the ranji trophy so it's a great sign for indian cricket uh, that you know teams which were not taken seriously uh, till about 2015 they were not taken seriously they are doing so well so i don't think mumbai cricket has declined uh, there are a few issues which again i i uh, i would like to cover in my next presentation the, the issues practical issues confronting mumbai and mumbai curs uh, but i don't think it has declined it is just that other states other cities have caught up all right uh kevan is also asking that uh, why doesn't mumbai have as many bowling or wicket keeping maestros again it's a question of uh, one generation inspiring the other so mumbai has had great batsmen it has had great bowlers of course but like you know between ramakan desai who bowled fast in the 50s and 60s uh, and uh, then you had a long gap till the 70s when karsan ghavri was there but again another gap before zahir khan emerged so the batsmen uh, mumbai has produced more legendary batsmen than than bowlers which is why uh, that is the case all right and uh, another debated question is is brabon india's oldest cricket stadium uh no uh, the oldest cricket stadium that is still used as a cricket stadium is uh, eden gardens kolkata because that i spoke about that three test series that england played against india in 1933 the first test series on indian soil the first test was played at the bombay jimkhana the second test was played at the eden gardens kolkata and the third test at what is at chepok what is now called the m h chidambaram stadium in chennai so kolkata and chennai are the two oldest test venues in india cci the brebon stadium uh, hosted its first test only in 1948 all right uh, there are quite a few actually you know a lot of compliments coming in devendra and in addition to that also some of them want to reach out to you as well so is there a way they can reach out to you and email of course you can uh, uh, you can contact me on email uh devprabhudesai@gmail.com that's my email id uh, 
you're most welcome to do so. Okay, great. Uh, and I think there's just one more question that's coming from Commander. Uh, how does one access the recordings at AIR if he knows or anything with BCCI? Uh, I AIR, I'll I'll try to get back to Khaki Tours uh, with with the person. Maybe you can contact uh, Khaki Tours after a week or so. I'll speak to somebody I know who, who might put. Uh, let's let's hope for the best. BCCI also uh, right now uh, they are in a bit of turbulence because they are uh, organizing the IPL in the UAE as we all know. So I'll I'll try to find out from the BCCI as well. But the BCCI has uh, videos post 1990. So would you be interested in that? And I'm sure that they would be selling them at exorbitant rates. Mm -hmm. AIR, I can definitely uh, put you in touch with the person once I get to know. So I'll let you know in a week's time. Sure, sure. that'll be great. Uh, I think that's all we have. So Devendra, just a personal question. Are you planning to go to Dubai for the IPL then? No, no. no. <laughs> I'll watch on television. I had my fill of the IPL when I was in the BCCI. Uh, I was involved in five IPLs from 2011 to 2015. That's that's more than enough. <laughs> okay. okay. You see, I'm a traditionalist when it comes to cricket. You know, so Test cricket for me is the ultimate. Yes. 2020, yeah, it's exciting, good, but Test cricket always wins hands down. Just like the views of Michael holding towards. Uh, test yes, cricket. very much. Okay, great. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Devendra, for this. Thank update. you. It's my pleasure. I hope all of you enjoyed, and uh, I look forward to seeing you for the next uh, presentation. The date will be announced in due course. Thank you.